Well, welcome. Good to be back with you. We are uh, off on an exciting journey. We're in the Gospel of John chapter 5. Uh, really one of the most remarkable Gospels, I think, that if you want that personal perspective, John, as one of Jesus' closest disciples, takes us right alongside. It's almost as if you're walking with Jesus through the streets and through the valleys and the countryside, and you're meeting those people firsthand. But John goes even a step further. John takes a moment to give you a glimpse into the person of Jesus and those around him. So I want to start with today's picture. And, uh, you know, this is Yosemite National Park. Uh, you know, we, you can find so many shots of this canyon. It's just so spectacular. But I'm going to say that I kind of like Sherry's the best. Uh, I think she just found this remarkable spot. And with the location and, and everything, I appreciate so much being able to look up the valley. Uh, Sherry, so thank you for this uh, beautiful, beautiful picture. I uh, hope you enjoy it. And uh, maybe someday you'll get to go and stand in this spot and say, oh my goodness, let's climb that rock together. Um, uh, just make sure you're with somebody who knows what they're doing and you are well taught and well trained. So again, thank you, Sherry. Let's get on to the Gospel of John now. Uh, we title this the Gospel of John chapter 5. Jesus takes a walk by the pool. So let's Let's just go back and listen for a moment to what Luke says about Jesus. Uh, he records Jesus saying this in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. This is going to set the stage for the events that are about to happen. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So, Jesus very clearly knows and has a sense of his purpose and his mission. Now, I'd like to jump right into John chapter 5 with you. I want to just read through these first three verses. And it kind of moves us through the story and brings us up to where Jesus is standing in the story. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, or Bethesda, having five porticles, or five porches. In these porches lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. Now, follow along carefully on the next slide. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season, or seasons, into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then, first, after the stirring up of the water slipped in, it was made well from whatever disease which he was afflicted. So, you know, that was the tradition. That is what the belief of this crowded group, or you could say small multitude, packed in around this pool. And Jesus is walking through this crowd. Now, keep in mind what we just read in the Gospel of Luke. And then John writes these words. And, there are, and a man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Now it doesn't say he sat there for 38 years, but if he believed in this tradition, then I'm going to say it's very possible he has been there a very, very long time. Now some people made little shelters to protect themselves from weather, from the heat and the cold and the transitions of weather that they experienced there in the Middle East. So you could tell if someone had been there for quite a long time. And we are told that his illness had plagued him for 38 years. Now just think about that. 38 years of suffering. <clears throat> I want to pick up now in John 5, chapter 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, 
I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, for while I'm coming, another steps down before me. If you were standing there beside Jesus, I'm sure many thoughts would come into your mind here about what you might be able to do to do community service to help him. If you were mission-minded, I'm sure you would probably pipe up and say, you know, Jesus, I'll stay here with him. Let me just spend a week with him. I will make sure he's the next one into the water. But that didn't happen in this story. Jesus said to him, well, get up. Pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well. Now, the man was fully aware that something happened in his body and that he was well. And, and the scripture says, and he picked up his pallet and began to walk. He didn't hesitate. I mean, he knew that this thing had happened. Let's reflect on this story for just a moment. In a brief moment, Hearing Jesus ask if he needed help, he embraced hope immediately. Now, I'm going to give you a big hint here. He did not know who Jesus was. Secondly, I want to point out that though this was filled with the people that believed in God, this place was not a place overflowing with the goodness of man. In other words, they'd run right over him and jump in the pool. They were going to get there before he did that. That is made clear in the text. The man testified to that. Would you like to be made whole? Would you like to be healed? Would you like to be restored? I have a quote. Part of this slide and the next one. I want you to listen carefully. Listen to what this author reflected on well over 100 years ago. Jesus does not ask this sufferer to exercise faith in him. I think you noticed that. He simply says, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. But the man's faith takes hold upon those or that word. Did you catch that? Jesus had given him no assurance of divine help. The quote continues, the man might have stopped to doubt, and lost his one chance of healing, but he believed in Christ's word, and in acting upon it, he received strength. He was healed because he acted on simply the words of Jesus. Now get this. No promises were made. He did not even know who Jesus was. He exercised his faith that the man who spoke to him spoke hope, encouragement, and he responded affirmatively and he said yes. Faith is always saying yes to God no matter what the rest of the world thinks. Now, do you wish to get well? Now, I want you to know that these words are available to each and every one of us. You see, since the Garden of Eden, our human nature has been separated from the very presence of God. Human nature manifested at that pool. The man said, everybody just runs past me and jumps in, gets in there first. They don't even care to help me. But I also want to make a couple other observations. This man simply had no spiritual power, naturally, to make himself spiritually well. But this is what I wrote on the slide. We simply have no spiritual power naturally to make ourselves spiritual or power to spiritually heal ourselves. We are truly like this man in need of the healing power of Christ. In other words, this man is us. It is important that we reflect on this story and confess the truth of our inability to fix our own nature, to fix the things that are wrong with us, the things that are broken in us. Paul put it this way in Romans 7, 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Even the greatest evangelist in the world confesses his wretchedness and he is in need of deliverance from this body of death. So by faith God gifted 
by the faith God gifted each of us, we too can receive spiritual healing by saying yes to Jesus and have a restored, living, and healthy relationship with Him. Jesus longs to respond to the exercise of the faith of each and every one of us. That was His ministry on this earth, and that is still His ministry as our High Priest in the heavenly sanctuary. I want to share with you Ephesians 2. 4 through 7. This is all going to be very familiar, I think, to many of you, but some of you, it'll be maybe the first time you've heard this. It reads, but God, being rich in mercy. Did you catch that? Rich in mercy? Abundant in mercy? Because of his great love, which he loved us? God is love, and do not let anybody tell you that we worship an angry God or a vindictive God. God is a God of great love that he loves us with. It's divine love, not anything like ours. Even when we were dead in our transgression, that man at that pool did not get himself all ready to meet Jesus. He was in a condition of brokenness and wretchedness, and he met Jesus just as he was. Even when we're dead in our transgression, Jesus made us alive together with Christ. It says, by grace you've been saved. In verse 6, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So understand how God sees this story. God sees in Ephesians 2 that Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus that God in his mercy, in his action, is moving towards us. He is making us alive in Christ. He is saving us by the power of God's grace, which is always God moving towards humanity. Jesus was moving towards this man who was broken. The man was not moving towards him he was just sitting there absolutely desperate for healing and it was Christ who encountered him and it says and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing richness of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus did you catch that? that the kindness of God is manifested in the power and the love of Christ. Those two are inseparable, that the actions of Christ is the heart of God manifested. And how, wh What does this text tell us? That God desires us to be restored and healed like the man at the pool of Bethesda. But he does more than that. He wants to see you as if you are already in his presence every day. That is what a restored relationship with Jesus looks like, feels like, and acts like. Now I want to come back to our story in John 5, starting with verse 9. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Now think of that as a padded uh, thing for him to lay on, okay? A, 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 almost like something you would lay down to sit in the sun on. It is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? Now, I, I just put notes to myself on my slides. You can see them right there. Did you notice the missing joy of his healing in the Jews as they approached this man? Notice that they just didn't celebrate with him. They just didn't have that joy. Oh, praise God, you have been healed. You have been restored. 38 years we know you have struggled with this. That is missing in the hearts of the men who encountered him. Something's missing in their life too, isn't it? Pick up your palate. Who said this to you? What is their concern? What is their agenda? I've said this a thousand times. Legalism 
hardens at times the hearts of men and women. And, and we get so caught up in the performance of others. It's so easy to pick apart their behavior as they are doing here in this case because he was in, the, in violation, listen carefully, of human tradition. Not scripture, but human tradition. But the man who was healed did not know who it was. Did you catch that? For Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. So, I, I just need you to resonate with this for just a minute. Understand this. He didn't know who Jesus was. But his faith in that voice that spoke to him connected and he responded and was healed. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he did these things on the Sabbath. What, what, what things did he do? He healed on the Sabbath. Did you catch that? God instituted the creation Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, to celebrate the finished work of God. Jesus, more than anyone in the universe, knows how to celebrate Sabbath, and he knows the depth and the meaning of the seventh day Sabbath. And here he is celebrating the seventh day Sabbath to heal a man who does not know him. To fully restore a man who's been broken for 30 years. Eight years. That should give you a sense of celebrating Sabbath. Verse 17, but he answered them, Jesus did. He said, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. You could say, I am working the works of my father. What does father in heaven want for you? Especially on the Sabbath. Is Jesus trying to say it's set aside not only for rest and restoration, but there's something about spiritual healing, maybe even something about physical healing involved in the Sabbath that Jesus celebrated. Maybe you should join in that celebration of that Sabbath. I want to close with Sherry's picture. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you how many waves crashed up against this rock that did not turn out to be that big splash. And I'm not sure how many times she got splashed standing there. I didn't ask. But I got to tell you, you know, it's just one of those ocean pictures in the afternoon. And you can see the fog in the background, but that big splash of that wave just comes up against that rock. I hope you almost feel that water land on you as you're standing there behind it. That is an action shot. Thank you, Sherry, so much for what it is you do. But thank you for taking a few minutes, just a few minutes, to listen to this profoundly important story. And may it speak things into your heart that connect you back to Jesus, the healer in this story, the Son of God, the one who forgives sins and heals our brokenness. Blessings. You have an awesome rest of your day. Don't forget to celebrate Sabbath. And take care now. Bye-bye.